Okay, so I'm going to sort of wrap up the overview of how we solve the Euler equations with these modern methods now, and then we're going to talk uh, hopefully this afternoon about uh, parabolic equations, and then we'll return back to the Navier-Stokes equations. So this is this is basically sort of an overview of where we are, um, and I'm trying to address at least some aspects of sort of what is the modern way of solving the Euler equations yet without getting so totally bogged down in, um, in uh, the, the details here, okay? So, uh, I'm just going to review a little bit where we are. Uh, we have mostly focused on the one-dimensional order equation. I'll show you a little bit about the 2D of this afternoon. So we're solving the conservation of mass momentum and energy. Uh, for we do incompressible flow, we often don't need to solve the energy equation or the temperature is important, we do that. And we made the assumption of ideal gas, which gives us the relationship between the pressure density and energy, okay? So uh, the way to solve this, uh, obviously, is to look at this as a system of equation where we focus really on the fluxes. And the center, the key idea when you're solving these equations with the modern methods is to work with the fluxes and to determine how the fluxes move uh, matter, momentum, and energy uh, from one cell to another. So the key, the, if you appreciate that we right in the middle there, um, then uh, that takes you far into sort of the modern literature of how to do this, okay? Now, we wrote down basically a um, one particular way of doing this where we uh, do the time integration in two steps. We do a predictor step. Uh, we de define the variables at the limits or the fluxes, and we limit the variables to be able to do then the final step. Okay? So we calculate the fluxes. And what I'm going to do in this lecture is just talk a little bit about solvers that use Riemann, that actually use um, Riemann solvers to uh, find the fluxes, okay? So um, the Riemann problem is, as we had talked about earlier, is basically, you know, given a left state and a right state that are, in our approximation, constant, uh, there are ways to do that for non-constant states, like in the ADR steeps, but we have not talked about that uh, to any significant degree. So basically, what you need is to you need to solve the Riemann problem for given left and right state, and that gives you the fluxes, gives you what flows from one cell to another. Okay. Now, uh, when I solved the Riemann problem for you for the shock tube, basically the important thing there was that you know it was a fairly complex problem. You had to solve iteratively for the pressure ratio uh, across the shock, and uh, that can be expensive if you have to solve that at every time. And secondly, because what you need from the Riemann problem really is not the full structure, you only need to know what goes between out of one cell into the other. There's been a significant number of efforts to actually simplify that process and to develop Riemann solvers that are cheaper to uh, cheaper to uh, use. Okay, so usually we use approximate Riemann solvers, and it's possible to approximate it in many different ways. Uh, it's a fairly elaborate uh, process. Lots of people have devoted uh, their important fraction of their careers to solve those problems, and I'm just going to give you sort of a little bit of an idea of what is involved in this one here, okay? So, uh, let me first say a few words about the Riemann, you know, the Riemann problem that you solve. Usually what you do is you linearize the equation locally in some way, and then you solve the linear problem, and you calculate the fluxes from that. And the nice thing about if you linearize it is that this, the problem, the Riemann problem, becomes pretty simple, okay? So, uh, I'm going to just walk you through sort of the major, the major steps in doing that, okay? Uh, so, we start with this linearized version. So, this is the Riemann problem where A is basically the derivative of the plot function with respect to F, okay? And now that because you have a system, you can actually find the eigenvalues. And if we define the eigenvalues, uh, then if we normalize the eigenvalues, basically what we get is a basis, okay? So, you know, remember when you go into eigenvalues, when you use the eigenvalues for new uh, orthonormal normal basis, you're basically rotating the solution so that you can write uh, the sum, the function itself, in this new uh, 
basis. So for this, our system of education, where you get three equations, the, the uh, vector f, which is basically the mass, moment, mass and momentum and energy, you can expand it now uh, with some weights, some new weights, w, in terms of these new eigenvectors, okay? And as you will see in just the subsequent slide, what this allows you to do, and we're going to, we are going to use the same argument when we do um, elliptic equations, is basically this allows you to take a system and you decouple it into linearly, in linear equations that are separate, okay? And we'll, we'll use the same trick, as I say, for the, uh, for the convergence of uh, elliptic solvers, okay? So anyway, uh, here, we simply plug in this expansion, okay? So uh, you plug in this expansion of uh, f in terms of w uh, with the, uh, with the uh, eigenvectors as the basis vectors. And using the fact that you know, these vectors are orthonormal, that is, they point they, they independent linear equations, you basically have a set of three equations that are all separate, okay? So wp back involves with uh, separately uh, and p being 1, 2, and 3. And because this is a linear equation, you can write down the solution exactly, okay? As a discontinuity, it simply propagates with the speed of the, of the appropriate eigenvalue. Okay? So you simply have translations uh, of the initial uh, boundary yeah, conditions, okay? Uh, and what that means, what that means is that if you have a discontinuous initial condition, so you have to find the uh, w that corresponds to the left and the right state, then you simply have the initial conditions, which are initially were a piecewise discontinuous solution. It simply moves into the se with separate speeds, either to the left or the right, as I've tried to indicate there um, in, in uh, the top picture. Okay? And the important thing is that in each interval, uh, the solution basically is a uh, the solution is piecewise constant. Okay? And if you do that, uh, you can actually easily write down now the fluxes, okay? So the flux for a linear equation is simply the speed times the value. So the flux here depends on whether the eigenvalues uh, go to the left and the right. So basically WP times lambda P is equal to the left uh, state or the right state, depending on the sign of lambda. And you actually can write it as one expression there uh, where we have written down the absolute value of the uh, eigenvalue. So if the absolute value is... Um, positive, uh, you, get, uh, you get WL, if it is negative, you get WR, okay? And, of course, for the system, now you just have to reassemble the system back, and uh, I've done that at the bottom, so once you've solved the, the linear problem, you can get the fluxes for the system, okay? Now, you still have to limit the fluxes and so on, uh, but um, this gives you basically a way to calculate what goes from one cell to another using the linearized problem as a start, okay? And I'm just going to show you one of those. Obviously, the key thing when you do a linear, when you do the linearization, the key thing is that you have to preserve the eigenvalues, okay? So you have to preserve the eigenvalues as being basically uh, the velocity and the speed of sound plus minus the velocity of sound. The speed of sound plus minus the physical velocity, okay? Uh, so you can do this, which means is that there are many there are many matrices that have the same eigenvalues, so the process is non-unique. There are many linearizations that you can actually um, come up with, and one of the better knowns, which I'm not really going to go through in any detail of how you come up with that, is uh, a, a linear solver to fill row from a long time ago, okay? So, um, so I'm just going to write down uh, that one, this becomes fairly involved, uh, and uh, as I said, I'm not going to spend much time on it, but Phil introduced this following matrix, okay, uh, where he introduced these weighted variables with square root of rho, okay? So when uh, Bram van Leer uh, introduced Phil at some point, you know, he said not only do we have rho, but we have actually square root of rho as well. Um, but this is basically <coughs> weighted variables. They actually go back to uh, to um, they also they were 
have emerged earlier in studies of stratified flow. But uh, the key point here is that, you know, you came up with a matrix. Uh, and uh, we can back out everything now, because this is the fluxes. Well, it's okay. So these are the fluxes. With, and the key point here is that they're more or less the same as I wrote down earlier. You have this, the region for the square root, uh, for the absolute value of lambda is basically to pick up the directions. Okay. The important part also is that the eigenvalues are the same as for the original equations, and in this case, the scaled eigenvectors, where you simply take the first element into one, are given by these R's over there. Okay? And I see that I have forgotten to. It should be R1, 2, and 3. Okay? Sorry about that. So, um, similarly, the alphas appearing in the equation at the top there, uh, they can be determined. And I'm just going to write them down for you. Basically, you can write down the alphas as a function of the state and the jumps, uh, where I have written down the definitions of these bar variables again. And uh, once you have that, you can calculate the fluxes. Okay? So here are the fluxes given by uh, the fluxes, again, uh, given for the, the row scheme uh, in terms of the lambdas, which we uh, already know, and the alphas that were given on the last slide, okay? So, you know, this becomes a little bit more involved than it was if you just worked with the plot function directly, but uh, this is an approximate scheme, and uh, therefore, you know, it's an exact Riemann solver, uh, or it's a Riemann solver where we only sort of focus on calculating the flux that comes up through. Okay, I, uh, this slide here was probably a little bit out of order, but you know, just to remind you that there are most of these Riemann solver methods are done with using what is called method of lines. That is, you separate out the time integration and the uh, spatial, spatial discretization. Uh, in the the lux wendorf method, remember, the space and time integration were tightly coupled. In those, you basically you can do time integration in any way you want, and here are a few very popular methods. Those have the um, properties that uh, if, the, if the Euler method is a TVD method, that is, if it doesn't introduce oscillations for linear equations, then uh, th these are supposed to do that as well. Anyway, um, so this has been a huge business. Um, you know, we're still getting articles for journal of computational physics that deal with some variations of this, although, as I said, mostly they, we are talking about uh, more advanced methods. I'll say a few things about that. Uh, there are courses where you spend all of your time on basically dealing with hyperbolic equations. I think Balsara's course in physics is pretty heavily focused on this. People have written books on this. Uh, here is probably one of my favorite, uh, Peter Wesseling has done many, many things. He had a thick book on uh, principles of computational fluid mechanics. I first ran into him when I was, uh, when I was, he did a multigrid solver uh, many, many, many years ago. And um, they have written a multigrid solver called Multigrid Delft. We kept asking them for a version, and then we needed different boundary conditions, so we asked them again, and eventually they said, ah, why don't you just modify it yourself, okay? And he was an editor of uh, associate editor of journal computational physics for, for many many years, and uh, when he retired, we actually had a special issue um, in his honor. And, and uh, you know, they take it seriously in Europe. You know, I, I was there, and we all dressed up in regalia, and, and you know, somebody read a letter from the Queen on, to to congratulate him. So, Why? The Queen, we don't do that in this country. But, you know, so anyway. And uh, one of the nice things about Peter's book is that, you know, he has a lot of MATLAB course, uh, codes available on the website. And it's fairly, if you want to go into more details, uh, there are a thick section of this book. Not all. It actually is much more comprehensive than that. Um, it has a fair amount here. And indeed, to show you how Rowe's scheme does, I borrowed pictures from his book. Um, so here is the performance of the Rowe scheme with the Euler equation. Uh, this is at a fairly low um, resolution, but you know you can tell that the density, velocity, pressure, and magna burn, and he has plotted entropy there that I didn't plot in the earlier one. Um, you know it does fairly well. 
and if you refine the grid, uh, you will do even better, okay? So here's 148 grid points, and you can see that it does pretty well. Uh, the, the, some of these linear schemes have problems in, for example, some of them don't do that well in rarefaction. One of the problems when you linearize is basically everything is sharp. Every sharp discontinuity just moves as a sharp discontinuity. So there are no rarefactions in the uh, linear scheme, okay? So they sometimes don't do well in that region. And people have proposed a number of fixes. Um, there's a, there's a, some of them are called, as I say, uh, have various uh, names such as the so-called entropy fix. Um, it's, is supposed to take care of, of artificial shocks that can arrive sometimes in the in the expansion region. Okay. Why the entropy is discrete a little bit after probably because there's some numerical dissipation in the scheme. Okay. Okay. So uh, you know these shock <coughs> methods a, they've been a big they've been a big part of computational fluid mechanics or in part of that, uh, this is actually not an area where I have done much work in. So uh, I've certainly seen a lot happening here because both this has been really, you know, going on during most of my uh, career in the field. And certainly for the journal, you know, we see a lot of this. But uh, this is not really, you know, where I have worked. But hopefully I have given you some flavor of what is involved. The key thing here is to understand the, the um, foundations of when you work with the conservation met conservation uh, equations in finite volume format and the key thing is the fluxes and what you do to limit them and to try to sort of keep them from getting generating too many oscillations these methods are very advanced by now uh, they really there really is you know if you calculate flows with shocks the shock pretty much is confined to a grid set okay um, and there have been some small, uh, you know, people get oscillations for stationary shocks, and there, there, there are still small wrinkles, but for the most part, I would say people are getting those out uh, as we speak. Okay? So, uh, again, this is just sort of a one, one note here that, uh, you know, some of the properties that can be rigorously shown for linear equations not always hold rigorously for nonlinear systems. Flows. However, uh, the general, my general impression is that um, if you do the linear equation right, there are you're well on your way to do the nonlinear one um, in some way. As I say, there are a number of other methods. I mentioned one here because this became quite well known, particularly in the aerospace business. It's called the affection of free splitting method. Uh, the key thing here was that they look sort of different, they have convection and pressure. Uh, this was, has been used widely, and one of the reasons sort of I was interested in it is because it's been used for multi-phase flows, for the average equation for multi-phase flows. Okay. And of course, as I said, the current way to do this is particularly the, its schemes like the Wino, the weighted Eno scheme, which we talked about earlier, uh, the ADAR scheme, which we also talked about earlier, so there are still, as I say, there are still methods to do it, and then there are methods that are sort of uh, that are sort of descendants of the CIP method, where you actually evolve other methods as well. Now, all of this has been done on regular uh, grids, uh, co-located grids, where the pressure and the velocities are at the same grid points. There are efforts to do that also on staggered grids. There are some benefits to it. So you know, you name it, and somebody has probably tried to do it. Okay. So the last thing I was going to say in this particular sort of section was a little bit about the two-dimensional flows, okay? And I don't have terribly much here to say, but I'll talk a little bit about how we can um, look at that in a little bit later, okay? So uh, in two dimensions, there's certainly been an enormous amount of work on two-dimensional Riemann problem, fully two-dimensional solver, and so on, but most my impression is that most of the work that is being done is done simply by splitting, okay? So you do the Euler equations. This is the Euler equation in two dimension. The, you add an equation for the momentum in the other direction. And the only sort of difference between the various terms is, of course, that the pressure uh, 
is only there's only one of the momentum equations uh, in each direction. Uh, so you have this vector form where the flux is in the x direction and the flux is in the y direction. Uh, obviously, if you do, for example, upwind, you have to split both of them. Um, and again, as I say, the in two dimension, they're almost always solved. Um, well, in most cases, they're solved by splitting. So here is one splitting. Uh, this is just the, if you want to do upweaving, for example, you would have to work with these um, different boxes, uh, where I have split both the F and the G here in uh, using the layer uh, splitting. So, um, you know, basically, it's, it's repeating the same thing we did for the one dimension. There's not much variable new here, except possibly in the boundary conditions. And, and then you program it up. And I'm just going to show you one example here, um, which was actually done quite a while ago. But this is a very standard test. And you will see this, if you look through the literature, you will see this over and over again. So this was done by Phil Woodward and, and Paul Woodward and Phil Colella. Uh, here, this is a way, way back in general computational physics. Uh, this was a review paper, so it was actually two papers that appeared together. It was Paul Woodward had a method called PPM, piecewise parabolic methods, and then it was uh, next to it was a paper, this one, the, um, uh, the review paper, and they tested enormous number of codes or methods that were popular at that time, and so they compared them, and I'm just going to show you a few of those uh, here. So this is the domain. It's basically a uh, shock generated because of a uniform flow hitting a wedge. You could also think of this because it's inviscid. You could also think of this as a, as a uh, basically a cone. You don't have to have a wall. And if you align the computational domain with the wall uh, and you give it the right inflow, you actually get a two-dimensional, or you get a box which, uh, which you can resolve by a uniform grid. And that was sort of the whole idea, was to give it a nice, uh, computational domain, so it wouldn't be difficult with uh, grid generation and so on. So they did a, a large number of calculations, and as I say, I'm going to show you a few, just a few of those. Uh, the first one is the essentially the upwind method. It's a good enough approach, uh, approach where you basically solve a linear pro, uh, um, you solve a, uh, essentially do upwind, okay? And, you know, as you can see, for a Grid that is on 30, 30 grid sets across, it's pretty diffused. You resolve it and it gets better. Okay? Uh, one of the key features to look for here is that it turns out that there's a rather complicated flow structure right here, and you don't really see any of it at any level in the Kuranov method, but you start to see that a little bit in my Coromax method, which remember is a second order method with artificial response. So here, you know, you've got to do that much better. And when you refine, you actually start to see a little bit of a jet that shoots back in here. And that will become clearer when we look at finer, higher resolution. So the McCormick method is pretty much a standard, a standard um, artificial viscosity method. And um, those two, on the other hand, are some of these higher order methods. The muscle method was monotonic upwind, uh, monotonic upwind or scalar conservation law, I believe. Uh, this was pretty much Bram van Leer's original method. And, and now you see when he refines the grid, uh, you see a clear jet structure that sort of shoots in here. Okay? And the PPM was a, a basically a, 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 a sort of a, a, a more advanced method using the similar ideas. Basically, you fitted a para parabola in the cells in that center of the line. And you see that this, you know, is resolving the shock extremely well here uh, at all levels. Okay. So the bottom line is that you know, if you do, if you use these methods, you can get very, very fine uh, solutions. Okay. Um, but, um, different methods. I think I'm Which one is right? They're not supposed to get. They're all supposed to converge to the same results. Okay. Presumably, if you took the good enough method, the upwind method. And instead of using 120 grid points, you, you used 1,200 grid points. You probably get, hopefully, you would get something that looked more like this. Okay. If you didn't, then it's second order. Probably then there's that, um, map format master is second order accuracy. Say it again. This master, the 
The second method measure. Okay, so the, yeah, the McCormack method is a second order method. It's second order accurate in smooth regions of the flow. Okay, so all of these methods, basically across the shock, they degenerate into first order. Okay, so they're second order in smooth parts of the solution. Indeed, the weak, well, the Uno methods are also they're high order in the smooth part, but across the shock, basically, you know, you have you always generate down to first order. Okay? But it's really the accuracy, not the order that people care most about. So, you know, if you have a method that resolves the shock in one grid cells and resolves everything else very well, um, that is, is that gives you an accurate solution. Okay? So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about sort of the project that I want us to do uh, in the last 10 minutes or so of the course. So I'm going to wrap up the current discussions of hyperbolic systems at this point, and basically saying that, you know, as I've said many times, is that there have been enormous progress for hyperbolic systems, and, uh, you know, there are methods now that are fairly elaborate and allow you to do the shock essentially within one grid set. Okay? So this has taken lots of papers, lots of effort, but pretty much it has um, evolved to the point where you can do very well. I had deliberately not focused this course on these hyperbolic systems for two reasons. Um, one is because I'm more interested in actually solving, you know, problems in the, in the sort of lower um, Reynolds number range that is, you know, mostly incompressible flows and things like that. Secondly, this is not an area where I'm really the expert in, okay? I know a fair amount about it, but uh, there, are, um, there are other people who have devoted their entire careers to these uh, efforts. So, uh, but I want to I want to 